Right. Well, welcome um, to whatever day of DevOps France it is. I've lost the plot. Um, I'm going to tell you an interesting little story, uh, of which, when you finish, may convince you that the life that you knew as a developer is it's not about to change tomorrow, might be changing sometime after that. So my name is Steve Poole. I work for Sonatype. Um, I used to work for IBM for a long time, did a stint at Red Hat. And I've come to Sonatype because I'm very passionate about teaching Java developers and others about security, as in not authentication and encryption, but the rest of the stuff, the bits that we really need to know. And this story is about why some of that is important. So I'm going to take you through three things, uh, sort of drivers, what's happening, how the, sp the cyber security, cyber attacks have changed. Uh, we'll talk about what the US government response is, is beginning to be, and therefore what other governments' responses will be, um, and how that will impact how we develop. So it starts off like this. One day, you come to work, and somebody says, oh, my application, I can't, the file's not open. Windows can't open this file. Or your systems won't start because you get blue screen of death or whatever you have. And it's, you know, something's wrong. And you do a bit more digging, and you find all sorts of interesting little files on your system that may give you a hint as to what's going on. And then, and or, another symptom is that you just can't log on to something. Whatever the symptoms are, somewhere there will be some information. And that information tells you that you've been hacked and that you're a victim of ransomware. And it will tell you what you have to do to get out of the situation. Right. Well, here's a real one. Real ransomware demand. This is, we've looked at your system, we understand how you work, we sort of know where you live, and this is what you're going to do to pay us. And then you pay us, we will give you your keys to get into your data. Okay? That's what goes on. Always there's a link to some cryptocurrency mechanism because anonymous cryptocurrency is the currency of choice for these big bad guys because it's almost untraceable. It's not completely untraceable. Occasionally they get caught, but mostly it's straight through. Okay. And you may go, okay, that will never happen to us. But I want to talk to you about how it does happen to you. right? And the reason I want to do this is because you have to see how this stuff is evolving. right? So... Yeah, lots of pretty pictures, but basically what happens, you get phished, uh, so you allow some malware in, the malware then calls home, pulls more stuff in, encrypts stuff, and eventually you're done. You're now in, you've now been compromised, and it all starts at the front door. It's not what you might consider to be usual phishing, right? We, what we get usually are things like this. Some think from somebody in the Bank of Nigeria saying, hey, we've got some money, and if you give us some, we'll give you more back. You know, that sort of thing. You know how it works, those sorts of things, you know. FBI ones. I mean, we all get these. You get them all the time. And they're all that silliness. Right? The thing about these is, is that they are not aimed at you from a sort of ransomware attack, these things are aimed at stupid, greedy, gullible people. So they are aimed, they are designed to be this silly, stupid level because they don't want bright people to have a conversation with them because you'll catch on. So this is designed to find the people who are just, who are so greedy and so stupid, right? And they always do. That's not what you get. Okay, you get things that are a bit more personal. You get things that tell that are based around your relationship with people because the bad guys watch you and then they'll construct something. So if the relationship you have with your boss, say, is not the best one, then and they and you've 
spoken about it on social media. That gets spotted and people will target you and they'll go, uh, you know, the idea is to send you something, text, Slack message, whatever, to you from your boss that says, do this now, don't bother me. And if you don't, if you're frightened of your boss, you're not going to do it. You're going to go, oh, I'll just do it and done. And that's a classic one. Okay? And then the other type of phishing you get that are very, very industry specific because the bad guys aren't the 15 year old hackers in the bedroom. They are people who understand your business inside out. And so you, they, things turn up that the best people in your business would have a hard dip, uh, job to identify. There's usually something wrong, but if you're busy and it looks almost authenticated, authentic, then too late, okay, it happens. And the bad guys use ransomware to target everybody. Um, interestingly, they tend to target government more than anything else. Um, well, partly because of what you'll, you'll see why in a sec, but also it's about how good your IT hygiene is. You know, those companies that have very good security may be not the best choices, but there we go. They'll attack you, they'll attack your company, they'll attack you, they'll look at your information, and they'll figure out a crafted way of getting into your system. Right? That's not what we used to have. What we used to have, you would say, would be called drive-by, which is bot-driven, trying to get into your systems. It just happens to be that you left the door open. Those things still continue, okay, but it's becoming much more sophisticated. It's becoming much more personalized. Right? The other way this stuff gets in is because of vulnerabilities. Because we are not very good at patching vulnerabilities, they get used, and these sorts of things, that's just technical, isn't it? There's no need to talk to a human being. If you haven't patched a vulnerability like the log4j one, uh, well, then that gets found and then malware gets inserted. Right? That's easy. Right? So what they're trying to do, and many other ways, is just to get into your systems. And one of the ways they get into your systems is not just to get into directly attack you, but also go up and say, what software do you use? Can I go and compromise somebody else's system? Right, because we're all part of supply chains. So very sophisticated, um, very uh, business focused. It may not be against you personally, of course, but it may be that you work in a particular industry or you're a company that works services in a particular industry that suddenly makes you a target. And they will try and get into you by going directly at you or some other way. Right? And of course, the answer is, is that they want to be able to get to this. They want to be able to run code. As long as they can run code on your system, then they can do whatever they want. Right? They call back for encryption keys. It's a very sophisticated process. Come in with a little payload, call out, get some more. And then they start encrypting your data. They watch your systems. They know which of the files you use the most and the least. And they'll start encrypting the least used files because it takes time. You've got terabytes of data, they've got to encrypt it. And they will work their way through this, right? These are sophisticated attacks. And they'll also be stealing your data, because why not? And they can do that in many ways, and including getting into the, the legitimate traffic that your system has, the legitimate communications your systems have with other systems, literally piggybacking off HTTP payloads and things like that, because they compromise your servers. Because once you're in, do whatever you want. And the back end, the people they're talking to is always a botnet, right? You're not, you wouldn't spot this on a normal day because it wouldn't be like, oh, suddenly my server's sending gigabytes down to this IP address. It's like packets and packets and packets to many systems in this botnet. So you wouldn't see it, right? So you might go, well, this is just ransomware. We've heard about this. This is not new news. You know, maybe you didn't know how it works, but you go, well, this is ransomware. We've heard about this. Well, the punchline now is ransomware isn't necessarily about the money. Ransomware can be a visible sign that a particular attack process methodology is successful. Ransomware can be the 
the visible demonstration that our mechanism of getting into your systems works. The money is useful because it can pay to do these things. But I want you to understand that what's changed is that the drive for money, the drive and the way, to, and the way of generating money by just doing whatever you can get your hands on, whatever's easiest, has changed because that's not all it's about anymore. Right? It's about something a little bit more horrible. Right? It's about cyber warfare. It's about people beginning to understand that they can compromise systems that are important to the economy and the functioning of a, company, of a country. Right? So they are now actively engaged in getting into power stations, getting into pharmaceuticals, getting into farms, getting into supermarket systems. That's what they're trying to do. Right? So they can get in there so that when they need to, they can manipulate or turn these things off. You think what would happen if uh, the GPS system for, for, drive, for the trucks that are used to I know, bring in the food to the supermarkets, if that got compromised? Or the ordering systems for supermarkets got compromised and they sent the food to the wrong place? Or the train signals stopped working because they got hacked? And that's actually, that's one we've already seen demonstrated. It isn't necessarily about complete stopping it, but disruption is fantastic. And then just being able to break systems where it's necessary. You know, it's the, uh, we shut down the, the highways. We um, turn off the electricity systems. We stop the oil flowing. You know, that's what they're trying to do. And those systems, as you can imagine, they're very sophisticated because the idea is to get in there and stay there until you need to do it. So it's a different type of attack that's going on now. Right? And though the money isn't particularly interesting to these bad guys, the amount of money is ridiculous. So I'm going to show you a curve. Um, the green line that you're going to see is the drug trade. And the drug trade is the illicit drug trade. We know all about that. We've seen all that happening. We know we all seen the movies. We all understand just how massive that F problem is. Uh, the red line is going to be the cybercrime thing. You ready? Pudunk. 2015, 2016. There, cybercrime. Uh, sorry, the drug trade was about 450 billion dollars per year, and cybercrime was about the same. And the predictions were. As you can see, that by now we'd be in the sort of six trillion dollars. Okay, that's can you imagine 450 billion dollars is what the drug trade brings into the bad guys. Six trillion, enormous number. Okay, and you think about that's just how much is that, right? So six trillion dollar of six trillion dollars turns out to be an underestimate. Six trillion dollars tricks six trillion dollars turns out to be out the amount of money that they're making out of ransomware alone. So we were way off the predictions. The predictions are that in total we're looking somewhere between twenty and thirty trillion dollars. You just can't imagine that, can you? That's one hundred and seventy five thousand dollars for every adult in the world. Many of us do not own $175,000. So obviously the money isn't coming out of us. The money is being sucked out of the economy in different places. And of course, we all suffer because prices go up. Things cost more. You know, that's what happens because people cover the cost. That's how much money is being leaked out. Right? That's where we are. Right? We have a situation where as before we were dealing with just bad guys trying to extort data and make money to a new environment where the bad guys are state-funded professionals. They understand the business they're targeting and they understand the IT. They are trying and using this stuff all the time, right? Very sophisticated, long-term attacks. And of course, it just turns out to be extremely lucrative. And of course, that money can go back in to do more. Right? That's where we are, right? 
this is what you need to start understanding is happening now. And if you keep track of what's happening in Ukraine, you will see occasionally some cybersecurity news about something being hacked on both sides, right? Everybody does this. This isn't a bad guy thing. This is every nation state and anybody else that can is going to be applying these techniques because that's what they want to do. They want to get into your systems, okay? And one of the ways they get in is through this, open source. Who uses open source? We all do, don't we? 90% of your application is basically open source because you use open source frameworks, you use open source environments, etc. It's like that. Well, I've just said this, 90%. So yes, yeah, so your application, all these dependencies, uh, the amount of open source out there is ridiculous, right? Uh, it just goes on and on. Let me pick a better picture, right? We trust open source so much that it's growing. You never really think about open source, it's just there. But when you start measuring it, you start to see just how much extra open source is being created, right? So lots of things are growing, but 20 trillion downloads a year of open source, you know, no Java, whatever, right? Enormous number of ways. And we trust all this stuff. Comes into our systems. Yes, we make great use of it. And all that open source that we use has problems, has vulnerabilities. And most often, up until quite recently, the bad guys, because they weren't funded enough, were looking for existing vulnerabilities. You know, they, we always have this, hey, vulnerabilities have been, been um, produced, bad guys try to exploit it. And that still happens, but now they do something much more, much worse, is that they build their own. And they are building their own attack vectors. And they do that by going to all the open source projects that they can find that you use and figuring out, can I get in there? So they'll do open source repo attacks, which is social engineering. Can I become part of a project? Can I commit things and I take control? Can I take over old projects? Can I do those? And that is happening. Right? And then there are other things like typo, typo squatting, which is where uh, they register packages in repos where maybe a couple of characters are tr transposed. So when you put a new dependency in, you spell it slightly wrong, but it gets found because the bad guys have registered that. You know, you've, we've all seen it on the internet with URLs where you type, or type in the wrong URL and you still find a website, even if you're, you've got the name wrong. Uh, that's what's happening in, the, in repos. Dependency confusion on the other side is where they understand things like what versions of software you're using and that maybe you're always relying on latest. And if the latest of a piece of software is, say, version 10, and they register version 9999, and you say, I want latest, you suddenly pick up some bad things. Now, it depends on all the repos you use, whether it's Java or JavaScript or Python or whatever, but they all have their pros and cons. But this is the sort of thing these guys are trying to do. They're trying to make use of your trust and your lack of understanding of how things work and your, uh, the fact that you do not expect these things to happen. And then the one in the middle is build tool attacks is even if as developers we're quite good at thinking about the security of our software, where, and the open source projects, we're actually pretty poor about worrying about the build processes that we use because oh, they're for development and you treat them, I don't know, more kindly and you find that the bad guys can all attack your build systems because they ne don't have the same security as their application. Because obviously, I don't even have to worry about trying to social engineer some changes into an open source project if I can just go to the build system and compromise it and insert whatever I want. Right. So this is all going on, okay? So look, look, think of it differently. Think of your application and all your dependencies, right? So they used to just look for problems, right? And now, well, now they're adding their own. Uh, in your dependencies, in the runtimes, in the platforms, in the compilers, they're looking for places where they can insert backdoors, right? And most of them are not designed to show up. They're designed to be hidden until they need them, right? 
and then they go off. It's a different sort of approach. Yeah. So the way that we think about our relationship with open source projects is changing. And it will change as it becomes more and more evident that open source projects are, can be compromised if they're not following you know, better rules. Right. And it's where this is all going to change the way we do things. Because we are, so far, we are all very used to just downloading open source. We go to Stack Overflow, we go, I need to do something. You get an answer which says, use this package, and you go find the latest version of Maven Central, and you stick it in your palm, and you're done. And it's like, no, no, you can't do that anymore because your choices aren't driven just by whether the feature that you want exists. It's also about the people who produced it and their ability to make sure that the software that you've consumed is safe. Right? These attacks on open source projects are just going through the roof. And these supply chain attacks, as they're called, where we're trying to get into the software above you that you use, has just rocketed, right? Because people have realized that this is a wonderfully weak link. So it's a big attack vector. And you have to deal with the fact that the stuff that you rely on has to be thought, th you have to think about it differently. Yeah. So <laughs> there's where we are. That's sort of like part one. Part one is bad guys are out there. They're differently motivated. They're much more sophisticated. And they are attacking the stuff that you use all the time, as well as yourselves. But they're definitely going open source over op uh, attacking open source projects in every way they can to compromise them. So last year, this man, um, some US president, um, obviously not him personally, but this executive order was put into place, which said, basically, let's fix this problem. And what this order said was, number one, well, we need to recognize that we have this situation. Uh, and, and the situation being not that there is cybercrime, because actually cybercrime is sort of a commercial problem. This was, no, this is the next thing, the cyber warfare activities. This is where it becomes real as far as, as, far as human beings are concerned, because your country is at risk. Your existence is at risk. And suddenly, well, we now have to take this seriously. So there's a bunch of talks. Big companies went to the White House, and they all talked about this stuff. Um, and, well, what happens? The executive order says, you will do this. And the, they basically said, here's a bunch of rules that you're going to have to follow when you start selling software to the US government. Right? Um, <laughs> there's lots of stuff. The one that you will hear most is about S-bombs. You may already have heard that floating around. That's going to be, going to become more and more part of our conversations. When you get software, what's the S-bomb? Software bill of materials. Digitally proof, digital proof of the contents of your software. What you consume and what you produce. Right? But that's the easiest bit. You look at all the other words there. Evidence, automatic, um, um, processes. It's all about looking at how you produce software and proving and demonstrating that that's true, that you have audit and evidence chains. So you think about all the open source that you use and you think about the consequences when the open source projects that you're consuming, at some point you're going to say, they have to fulfill all these requirements because otherwise I can't use them. So you can see how the way that we do software is going to change because somehow all this has to happen and it's going to be our, we're going to be asking tiny open source projects and very large open source projects to fulfill this. It's going to change a lot of stuff. You can imagine that human beings involved in, process, in some of this stuff may give up and go, I can't do that. Maybe you'll stop using them because they don't fulfill this. And maybe companies will turn up and help us do this. But this is becoming reality. This is what's going to prick, trickle down to us as developers that some part of or all of this is going to become part of our day job. Now, the S-bomb, there are two choices currently as far as the um, executive order is concerned. There's Cyclone DX and SPDX. SPDX 
EU may have heard about, they do copyright checking and stuff like that. And Cyclone DX is specifically for this. It doesn't matter which one you pick, they're both going to be used. Right? But these are the sorts of names you're going to see turning up, SPDX and Cyclone DX and S-bombs. They're the things they're going to be talking. And you're going to be start to hear terms around build processes like reproducible builds and all sorts of things, which are all the steps that we have to take to stop fulfilling this. Right? Right? The consequences of having S-bombs are pretty big. So the plus is that when we're looking for vulnerabilities in software, the first thing the vulnerability tool has to do is work out what you've got. Now, S-bombs invert that and say, I can prove what I've got because I have an S-bomb that's digitally signed, that's connected to all the other S-bombs, so I know that this thing with this digital signature checksum has this content, which is really fabulous because it means we don't have to have tools that are trying to figure it out and get it wrong and then find that then miss some vulnerabilities. Right. So, um, yeah, so let's move past that one. Yeah. Right. So, uh, where did I get to? Yes. Let me go back. Okay. So, um, existing tools, analyze what you've got, right? And that requires transparency, that requires you uh, having build processes that don't hide the version numbers, don't create fat jars and things and, and obfuscate, obfuscate stuff, okay? And which can happen. You can find that the tools can't figure out what you've got because some build process was not standard, something happened, it's like, no idea what we've got, just got stuff, okay? And of course that can be faked as well. Just because you've got something that says, hey, I'm version 10, doesn't mean it is version 10, the bad guys can fake that, right? So what an SBOM does is it says, we're gonna provide evidence of everything that was in your system, right? Everything, ultimately, not just the dependencies, but also the runtimes, the compilers, okay, all the stuff, right? So that your basics of, I have a product and I have a couple of dependencies, you know, becomes, well, actually, I have a dependency, a reference to somebody else's S-bomb, you know, some URLs somewhere else, some signatures, so I know that that S-bomb is valid, you know, more stuff, but, it expands, so you have your main product and then you have all your dependencies and you'll have one for your dependencies, your compilers, your operating systems. Eventually, you'll be able to track everything that you that is essential to your application, right? Because even compilers can be corrupted. So all this information. Now, we're not at anywhere near this stage, but this is where it's heading. And obviously some pragmatic line will end up being drawn about what we can do and what we can't do. But this is sort of currently, you know, where this school will end up. And the problem, of course, that is that, uh, well, it gets a lot. So suddenly you have a lot more information about how your system is built. And the problem with that, of course, is that um, now we're more likely to find the vulnerabilities. So whereas you're running scanning tools that will tell you I think you've got a vulnerability because you've got this version log4j. This will tell you that you exactly have that log4j version, right? Oh, and by the way, you also use this compiler, which has got a vulnerability, and you did this, which has got a vulnerability. So you end up with uh, more issues, more vulnerabilities to fix, which itself has a consequence to us, right? Which is the way you're going to build software has got to change because now you know that you have vulnerabilities, so now you've got to start patching, and, it's, and you've got to do it in an automated way. And the directive from the US government, which of course will get adopted by other governments, is also pushing us towards automa automation because human beings involved in a production process are a source of uh, potential insertion of bad code. So they're happy for you to press the button but your human being shouldn't be involved until the binary is produced. So that's gotta happen. And then these other reasons for doing it is that you're just gonna have all these vulnerabilities coming through because now you know what software you used, right? right? And even if you're not part, even if you're, 
you think you're outside of a supply chain, you're not really, we're all part of a supply chain. And if anybody consumes your software and that person then sells to the US government or wherever, whatever the distance is, this is gonna get to you. Whoever you are, this is gonna become more and more important, okay? And the prediction is by 2025, and the prediction is the US government saying that basically we want it done by 2025, is you won't be able to sell software unless you have all this stuff. Okay. Now, you know it's a big stick, but you can see it's really important because we don't really have all, any of the defences we need to deal with the bad guys and what they're trying to do. Ooh. Okay. I think I've said all this. Yes. It's about being able to build your software automatically because the vulnerabilities turned up, which you'll be getting on a regular basis. It's about providing people evidence of how you built your software. It's about being able to consume other people's evidence and rely on it, right? Because you need to do that. We're building this new type of way of how open source projects, all projects relate to each other. And basically it says everything becomes, everything is code. You know, we used to have infrastructure as code. Now we're moving to one level above that. You need to start thinking about how you deal with these things. And then you have to think about this open source that you're choosing, the 90% you rely on, because it's got to comply. And if it doesn't comply, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna not use it? What happens if it's three layers down? You're relying on something, relies on something that relies on it. You, know, you can see how this is gonna have some interesting uh, consequences to us. What's their ability to provide updates? What's their security posture? You know? And even if they said, oh, we can do this for you, do you trust them? We all trust open source projects implicitly. We just download code and it does what it says. But if you've been reading the news you know, over the last few weeks and months, you should know by now that there are many open source projects that are being compromised because it's possible, it's happening, it's useful. So it, you know, that's where we are. Okay, so. What tools can you use to help you with all this stuff? Can you, is there anything out there? Okay. Well, um, there are many tools that can give you some insights. Right? You, know, you can go to GitHub and you can find code quality tools, code review tools, build tools. Right? But they're somebody else's tool. So you have to decide whether you trust them as well. You can't just turn this stuff on and go, yeah, tick, it does it because they may not be good either. So you've got to start thinking differently about this stuff, right? right? Yeah, and there's even ones that tell you about dependency management, GitHub, I mean, there's just loads of this stuff, right? And even if you have the best, oh, I wonder how that got in there, let's move on. Um, even if you have the best software tools, they actually still haven't caught up. So it comes down to these three things. Oh, okay, hold on, that's better, right, you've got, Three things that you have to use now. Three things that you use all the time, but you need to start exercising them about your consumption of open source software. You need to use your brain, you need to use your eyes, and your nose. You need to smell the software. Okay? You need to look with your suspicious brain. You need to think about, do I trust these guys? It's a really hard thing, because we're so used to not having to do that. We just use stuff. And you can't do that anymore. You've got to say, before I download something, yes, it's got the features I want. Let's go find the project. Right. Now, you know, Sonotype is in this business. So we are looking at, well, what information can we help you with? But that's coming, right? Because we've all got to work out what that means. What you've got to do is put it into your head and start going, okay, what would make me suspicious? Okay, and you know, so there are some rules that you can follow that are, you can automate, like, well, obviously you don't, you don't use an alpha build, you know, which amazingly people still do, right? right? And you don't upgrade to vulnerable versions. So if you're on this version it's got a, and it's got a vulnerability in, you don't go to a, one, a later one that's got vulnerabilities in, but amazingly people do, right? right? But you just look at these and you start saying, um, what's suspicion? 
uh, what happens if a compo you see a component has been, you have an open source project, it releases on a regular basis. And then what happens if it starts changing that and you get, rather than one a month, you get five a day and then it stops. That's a bad sign. That means either they were trying to fix something or they got compromised and their build servers got triggered off. Because remember, once it gets into the build system, into the, onto repos, you can, you can download it, right? So you have to start putting into those, using your suspicious brain and start looking at things like, does it even have a security MD file if it's a GitHub project? Do they tell you how you should report issues? Do they tell you that you shouldn't, um, uh, you shouldn't raise an issue, you should email an address? I know. Do they have vulnerability reporting processes? Do they have build processes? How, go look at who can trigger it. It's quite interesting that a lot of open source projects, almost anybody can trigger it, right? And just generally assess their quality. So there are metrics beginning to be established that will help us get a little bit closer uh, thinking about whether this is a good, good as in uh, have good hygiene, right, or not. But these are things you've got to start using your brain to, okay? You know, things like unexpected release frequency, I've said. The committers, do they have 10,000 committers or do they have two? If they have 10,000 committers, anything could happen, right? If they have two, maybe it's better. But if you go to an open source project and the last release was seven years ago and then suddenly all these changes are happening, right? Because again, that's something else. We, we download software. We might, we might go to the project to see if it's active because we're sort of like, well, is it current? And if there were bugs, would it get fixed type of thing? We think about that. But it's looking for those signs that says, yeah, I'm not sure. Do I really want to use this? Right. And then there are other tools. Do they tell you that they use their own static analysis tools for finding bugs? I mean, what do they do to keep you safe? Right. So it is all time consuming. You know, it's not only about you getting your stuff into 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 fit state. It's everybody else's. It's just, you know, you can see why this is going to be a problem. So the obvious thoughts out of all this is that we're going to have to be building these automated systems. They are coming because that's how you provide proof. All these uh, audit trails, evidence-based stuff is going to be the requirement. Now, maybe it'll take a few years to get to you because maybe you're on the side, but I bet you the open source projects that you're consuming, the major frameworks, are going to get hit in the head soon to make, start doing these sorts of things because we rely on those, right? And if we do it wrong, Productivity is going to go through the floor because we'll be dealing with all this stuff by hand or semi-automated. So, you know, this is not good. So you can imagine that what's going to start to happen is, is that your choices about where you get them, where do you get the support from them for open source projects? Uh, you can imagine people starting to turn up. Remember when GDDPR came out? GDDPR came out and we had all this situation where we couldn't, we had all this pain. And everybody was going, well, this is just awful. And then a few companies turned up and said, we'll do it for you. So my expectation is that over time, the pipelines that we build, the build processes we use, the processes will move away from being something that we just create ourselves to being services that we buy, or at least provided by somebody else. You know? You know? It's that sort of anybody who can... If you can use, if you've got those solutions and you start adopting them, then you're ahead of the curve and you're giving people what they need to. And it becomes a competitive advantage if you can actually rise to this challenge. Right? But it's still a hard one, right? But this is the cost, right? That's where we are. We have all these new motivations. Bad guys are not trying to just steal our money. Bad guys are trying to get into our systems, okay? And therefore, the way that we're looking at dealing with all this sort of stuff is by trying to change the way that we build, process, build our software so it's more evidence-based, more reproducible and traceable. And that has all these consequences on how we do our job. Right? It's, and it's going to affect all the open source projects out there because they're all part of the story as well. 
not just us, it's all the stuff that we rely on. And you can just see where this is going. Right, right. It's up to us to make the change. I mean, that's where we are with this. It's, 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 you can't hide from it, and we need to help everybody do this. We need to start m looking at how we can help these open source projects, not necessarily with money, but help with you know, turning up and going, can I help you make your systems more secure? Can I help you install tools? Can I help you do things that would make you just a bit better and help you move towards these sorts of requirements? Because that's what they need, is they need people more than money, right? So there we go. Um, whirlwind tour. Bad guys are doing things differently. They're differently motivated. The US government and others are getting their acting because of the fact that now we have countries that are consider their existence at stake, that it's become real. And as a consequence, uh, the way that we produce open source, the uh, way we produce um, software is changing and will change in whatever direction this goes and however pragmatic we become, you can bet that though there are going to be consequences to all of us on how we do this. You know. And so, is it game over? Don't think so. It's just we're going to be doing software development differently than we were expecting uh, ourselves to do before there was a thing called cybercrime. Okay, uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? If not, you can find me wandering around or just go to the Sonotype booth and tell them to come and get me. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much. <laughs>